A court battle over same-sex marriage, a crackdown on gun violence in the state capitol. The state loses jobs, the governor talks about winning, and the devils get sold. All ahead on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Wells Fargo, together we'll go far. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello once again. Well, the Garden State has now become ground zero in the battle over same-sex marriage. This centers on those who insist that civil unions just aren't good enough anymore, and state officials who say there's nothing wrong with the current law. And both sides took those arguments into a courtroom in Trenton today. Our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, was there. Judge Mary Jacobson heard the attorney for six gay couples and a gay organization argue that one of this summer's U.S. Supreme Court decisions has changed the landscape. Every day, he said, same-sex couples who are not married are denied more than 1,000 federal rights and benefits. They go to issues like health care, domestic support, tax benefits, the right to be buried together, survivor annuities, welfare. Um, family and medical leave, as I've mentioned, loans, VA benefits. The plaintiffs want the judge to immediately declare same-sex marriage legal in New Jersey and end this two-year-old court case. They say the current setup allowing civil unions is unequal. People who live and work and pay taxes here need to be treated equally. At this point, it seems utterly ridiculous that it is not just common sense. The Christie administration is defending the current scheme. The state attorney general's office told the judge a declaration of unconstitutionality would be premature and questioned whether the state even has jurisdiction when it comes to federal benefits. Just because there is a remedy for a wrong doesn't mean the court has the power to impose that remedy upon the state. The judge asked challenging questions of both sides. The plaintiff's attorney said he came away optimistic. I just don't think that a court at the end of the day is going to buy the argument that we need to wait until we know what's going to happen with every single of those over 1,000 benefits um, and with regard to every single plaintiff. The legislature has passed a gay marriage bill, but Governor Christie vetoed it and said put the question on the ballot. The organization Garden State Equality is predicting a veto override this year or a victory here in court, success through either legislation or litigation, as they like to say. Why should they be treated as second-class citizens? Why is the state of New Jersey in the practice of creating a second-class citizenship for its LGBT population? The word marriage holds weight, and I hope that the courts understand that. No judge or justice has the moral or constitutional authority to change the definition of marriage or family. Judge Jacobson said she'd have no decision until September at the earliest. Whichever way she rules, an appeal from the losing side is a strong possibility. So the struggle over same-sex marriage in New Jersey will go on. For NJ Today, I'm Michael Aaron in Trenton. Crime was making headlines in the state capitol today. Two Trenton police officers were shot while responding to a call about domestic violence. The suspect was killed. Those two policemen underwent surgery. Both are expected to recover. All of this happened on the very same day that the acting attorney general announced a new multi-agency effort to crack down on the gun violence and murders that are plaguing New Jersey's capital city. Working shoulder to shoulder with the Trenton Police Department, Troopers will patrol the most violent areas of the city, providing a direct, visible deterrent to open-air drug dealing and wanton violence. 
This campaign is being conducted by state, county, and local police, along with the U.S. Attorney's Office and four federal law enforcement agencies. Newark police have now gone public with the way that they stop and frisk. Their website now has a listing of the race, gender, and age of every person that they stopped and frisked last month, all 2,109 of them. Newark police say about 25% of those folks were in fact arrested. They also say that this policy makes them one of the most transparent police departments in the entire country. There was another big announcement in Newark today, the announcement that the New Jersey Devils have now been sold. Our David Cruz has that story. There was optimism at The Rock today, something that has been in short supply here of late. With the Devils mired in debt and missing the playoffs this year, there was talk of the team getting taken over by the league because a buyer was hard to find. But today the pressure was off. New owners Josh Harris and David Blitzer, who also own the Philadelphia 76ers, say they are bullish on the Devils. I think the New Jersey Devils are the envy of 99% of the NHL uh, from the standpoint of their performance on the ice. So don't really want to change that. The sale is rumored to be valued at over $300 million, although no one at today's announcement would confirm that number. The Devils have won three Stanley Cups and have made five appearances in the finals. That's an enviable record for any sports franchise. But the real plum of this deal is The Rock, which was eighth in the world and fourth in the U.S. in gross ticket sales for concerts and other shows last year, according to Billboard magazine. Our jobs here when we work on the business side is one, obviously, to generate some revenue and to make sure that we can, we can uh, funnel it back to the team so we can create that, um, that advantage. And, and the second part is to create a home, home ice advantage here. We want this place loud and proud, loud and Jersey proud. And so we need you, we want you, and we love you. But it hasn't always been love between ownership and the city of Newark. The arena was built with a quarter billion dollars in public money, and the resentment between former owner Jeff Vanderbeek and the city, which did not make out as well as it had hoped on revenue sharing deals, has sometimes boiled over. He is a high pollutant, high class huckster and hustler. Anybody who suggests that Jeff's relationship and the team in the building under his guidance the last 10 years was, was strictly a contentious relationship, I think that's unfair to exactly what Jeff's commitment was to this community. As for Vanderbeek, the new owners say he'll maintain a minority share and have an as yet unspecified role in the team. I think this whole area around here is going to be redeveloped. I mean, Triangle Park, I think, eventually is going to get, get done. I think there's plans for a, f a bridge over into the Ironbound on the whole, uh, what is, I guess, south side of the arena. You know, there's plans to redevelop that in mixed use. All that stuff, I think, is going to get done. Even Mayor Booker, who was against the arena before he was for it, expressed optimism. We caught up with him yesterday before the sale was officially announced. I'm thrilled about our arena. Uh, this uh, new owner, uh, uh, should have become official, uh, is going to be part of a great city, a part of a great community, and we're just looking forward to welcoming him uh, with open arms. Instead of talking about debt and other financial problems, the discussion now is about hockey and entertainment and how to get and keep fans coming back to the rock. In Newark, I'm David Cruz, NJ Today. They will know where you go. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop is Freehold Township, where license plate readers have been installed at the entrances to the Freehold Raceway Mall. No other major Jersey mall has done this, but the Monmouth County Sheriff says they need to know who's coming and going to guard against terrorism. Critics say this is another example of Big Brother snooping. Our next stop is Hoboken, where the bathrooms are back. NJ Transit says they finally finished repairs of the storm-damaged restrooms at the Hoboken Terminal. That terminal took a huge hit from Hurricane Sandy, and the historic waiting area is still awaiting renovations that begin in the fall. And our final stop is Montclair, where the Greenleaf Compassion Center finally reopened today. The state's only operating dispensary for medical marijuana wasn't dispensing anything for the past seven weeks because they had to regrow their inventory to acceptable medical standards. It took longer than expected, but now they're filling prescriptions once again. And that is your Garden State Express for Thursday, the 15th of August.
Well, Governor Christie may be running for re-election, but he was in Boston today telling the Republican National Committee what they need to do to win back the White House. This was supposed to be a private meeting, private speech behind closed doors, but some audio recordings did get out. And on those recordings, you could hear the governor playing up his record here in New Jersey, defending Republican Party principles, criticizing those who call the party stupid, and saying that it's time to end what he called the navel-gazing and academic arguments and to focus on winning. And Governor Christie told his fellow Republican leaders he is all about winning. The Christie administration released the new jobs report today. It shows the state unemployment rate fell to 8.6 percent in July. That is one point lower than it was one year ago. But the report also says New Jersey lost almost 12,000 jobs last month, with those losses split almost evenly between the private industry and the public sector. And the Democratic candidate for governor, Senator Barbara Buono, says this proves that the governor's policies just aren't working. All right, joining us now to talk about those numbers is the Commissioner of Labor and Workforce Development, Hal Wirths. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me again. So last week we talked about the unemployment number and the job number, and we said, don't worry about the unemployment number going up, it's the jobs number. Yes. Hey, this, we got a complete flip this time. Yeah. What's going on? Well, look, it's, we just came off of five um, consecutive months of strong job growth, and uh, these are preliminary numbers, and they showed, you know, that we did have job losses in both the private and public sector. It was almost about, evenly yeah, divided. Yeah, almost evenly um, mm. um, split. So, you know, one thing I've learned in being in this job almost four years, the month-by-month -month numbers, you know, of course, you always want them to be um, up, but, you know, the preliminary numbers, last month we were revised upwards 20%. And May's numbers, we were revised up 3,000, 18,000 job creations. So in the last five months alone, we created 40,000 jobs. Or from July to July, we've created um, 75,000 jobs. So this one month um, preliminary numbers, I'm not going to get too excited until I see the revised numbers next month. And the, the other thing is, looking back on history, six out of the last seven Julys have had similar drops like this. Last July, we were within 400 job losses of this July. So with something going on in the month of July, we're having substantial job losses and unusually strong rebound. So. Something structural in our economy? No, I think more, you know, what we've asked BLS and we looked at, I think maybe more might be something to do with the school closings or the, the college closings or something that's skewing the numbers in July. Like I said, six out of seven months of um, July showed pretty bad and numbers in this year are almost identical to, to last year. But the overall trend has been very, very positive. Nine out of 12 months of job growth. So like I said, five consecutive months of job growth in a row. And this was our first stem down month. But again, they're preliminary numbers and we'll see, see what happens. The unemployment rate did tick down. We're down over a full point in the unemployment rate, which is a very major shift down from a year ago today. So the, the unemployment rate's going correctly. The other, the other thing that, uh, that struck me was in terms of like average hourly, average weekly earnings down a bit. What was, what's what work there? Well, again, you know, they were down, I think, very, very minor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the month to month numbers, um, you know, I know the CPI is coming out and, and all the, the UPI checks and the workers' comp checks will be going up. So, you know, it was down, I guess, a few cents um, mm -hmm. per hour, but I don't think it's anything significant. Talk to me about the areas that we've seen uh, the greatest number, the sectors where job loss has been prevalent, uh, leisure and hospitality, which was growth just a few months back. Yeah. That's what makes, you know, a little suspicious of the preliminary numbers. You had big losses in, in leisure and hospitality. Construction, I find it hard to believe that the construction jobs are down 2,000 with the rebuilding from Superstorm Sandy. So what, these could numbers... That, could that be theoretically because there was a spike in building and maybe things were backing off? No, I, no the, the construction industry, way it's recoups, has a long ways to go. And, you know, a lot of the money is just hitting the streets now on the construction um, industries. I was at a function last night where one gentleman was telling me the most difficult thing is finding a construction worker to do repairs on his house. So mm -hmm. these numbers, um, remember, it's a very, very small survey. It's 1,200. I know when there's good months, we're, we're happy. But on, on, month, on one month like this, I don't really get too excited. And I look at the trend that everyone always wants to know what the trend is. And the trend is definitely our friend is going in the right um, direction. You know, we've created 143,000 private sector jobs since February 2010, which I always say is a low point, you know, where we lost over a quarter of a million jobs. So five months in a row, nine out of 12, I think we're definitely headed in the right direction. And I think when, um, hopefully when I'm back here next month, it'll show that this was just a temporary blip as it has in the, in the past July's. Before you go, I know you had an event today in my old neck of the woods up there in the Palisades Interstate Park area uh, near the Alpine boat launch. Uh, 
where you're, you're finding a way to get people to work over there. That's very exciting. That's the $15.6 million grant that um, the Christie administration got from the federal government right after Superstorm Sandy. And that park had a lot, a lot of destruction. And we were actually we picked it up from a Bergen record store and, and reached out to them and said, hey, look, we could supply workers to help them repair the park. And uh, they had about eight miles worth of trail damage. And look, at that's the good part about this job. 800 people that didn't have jobs before are working. And the pride that these 11 fellows uh, that I spent a lot of the morning with them um, showed in, you know, not only you're putting a paycheck in their in their pocket, but they're also doing great work, and they're all saying how proud they're going to be able to say to help that they restore that restored the great park after Superstorm Sandy. So, you know, that's that's great. We're working in 13 counties with 800 workers still cleaning up after the storm. So, you know, that's that's the great part about doing this job, putting people back to work. Commissioner, have to leave it there. Sure. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Mike. You know, we have heard so much about the Jersey comeback and how we're stronger than the storm. But those slogans, well, they seem to ring hollow for some victims of Hurricane Sandy. And those folks sounded off today to state lawmakers who gathered in Atlantic City. Our Lauren Wonka was there. It's been 10 months since Union Beach resident Simone Daniker lost the entire first floor of her home to Superstorm Sandy. Frustrated by mountains of paperwork, the ordeal brought her to tears today. It's a very emotional thing to deal with this on a daily basis. It really takes away from your well-being. Daniker told her story at today's joint legislative hearing in Atlantic City. The goal? To discuss what's working, what isn't, and what's still needed since Sandy ravaged the Garden State. We have gotten more help from nonprofit organizations. They're doing more for our little town than the state is. You know, the state has got us, again, wrapped up in so much paperwork. It consumes your life. Shark River Hills resident Leanne Newland says her Monmouth County home is still uninhabitable. Faced with over $220,000 in elevation and repair costs, she received half that from her flood insurance company. Now the house is on the market. To date, we have paid our mortgage of $2,500 a month and storage costs of $300 a month and can no longer justify these large expenses. Newland called out departments she said fell short of their responsibilities, including the DCA, the Department of Banking and Insurance, and the governor's office. And she took aim at New Jersey's Stronger Than the Storm campaign. The recent TV ad campaign depicting life at the shore is back to normal is highly disturbing. Life is not normal. Atlantic City resident Sonia Rankin Daly has been displaced since Sandy. She's been living in a hotel room with her family. The problem I'm having is when you call housing authority, you're getting go to this line, go to that line, go to that line, and nobody can give you no answer, no answer whatsoever. Experts from various organizations also spoke at today's hearing. Former DEP Commissioner Mark Moriello called for more open discussion on how the federal San Diego dollars are being spent. We're a little bit drunk with all this money. I mean, this federal appropriation is massive and, and it's unprecedented. And it sort of makes you a little bit less concerned about what you do because there's so much money. But we can't lose uh, sight of the fact of being smart and how we spend the money. The chairs of both committees say they'll work to craft legislation to help storm victims, along with reach out to other departments in the state. Senator Bob Smith is expected to hold another hearing in Trenton in the coming months. In Atlantic City, I'm Lauren Wonko for NJ Today. We got word today that five New Jersey organizations will get $2 million from the federal government to help people enroll in the new health insurance exchanges. And joining us now is the regional director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Jaime Torres. Doctor, welcome back to the program. Thank we you, appreciate Mike. that. This, now, this is not the first go around for the so called, uh, I guess, well, navigators is what we're calling them right now, but this is, uh, you've got a, a geographic representation of people who are supposed to. Do what precisely? Well, these are navigator programs for the what is called the federal facilitated exchanges, which mm -hmm. New Jersey is one of them. Right. And it was announced just an hour ago, and we have five groups here in New Jersey. And this will be in addition to the federally qualified health clinics. Mm -hmm. We have 20 in New Jersey who, who receive 
$3.6 million. They have 125 sites. So these are two groups that are funded by the federal government to enroll during open enrollment. Do they go out looking for people? Do they put up signs? Do they go on the internet? How are they supposed to find these people? So they will have a different plan, but they will be over covering the 21 counties of the Garden State. And they will have a plan that they submitted for, for this grant application. But they will be on the ground. They will be in the communities. They will be also talking people with different languages to make sure that we can reach all the 900,000 people who are uninsured in New Jersey. There have been some national surveys out that show a, a lot of people are still not aware of what's to come starting well, October 1st. October 1st, yeah. open enrollment begins October 1st nationally and it will last until March 31st. Look, this is a hugely new program. It happened with the Medicare Part D. It happened with Medicare in 1965. Mm -hmm. So we know there's a lot of lack of information and misinformation, and we're on the ground, our department, and many, many partners in, in the Garden State to make sure we get the word out. For people who would like to participate in these health insurance exchanges, to, to buy health insurance through them, and I believe there were, what, there were four companies in New Jersey that have applied to, to sell insurance, right? Yes, and they haven't been announced yet. They will be announced soon. So they are, they are, we haven't made that official, but we will make well, that announcement well, soon. Well, I'll tell you, uh, we hear that it's Aetna, AmeriHealth, Horizon, and something called Health uh, Republic Insurance of New They're Jersey the as well. Yes. What, uh, I guess my question is, is why did they, I, I don't see Cigna, I don't see United, I don't see some, some of the biggest health insurers in this country here. Well, this has not been announced, so I can really not comment on that, but all those uh, applications have been vetted. They have to make sure they follow the uh, regulations that are set forth by the federal government. So when, when they're announced, I'll come back to tell you and probably give you that answer. I appreciate that. For people who do apply, ultimately, for health insurance through the exchanges, what, what's the cost factor going to be compared for to others outside? Well, one of, this is one of the things. We want insurance that will follow the rules and obviously that will offer affordable coverage to every person applying to the marketplace. So we're talking about affordable coverage that will have 10 essential benefits. Mm -hmm. They can offer more. Mm -hmm. And that had to be affordable. But also importantly, we're going to offer tax breaks, tax subsidies mm -hmm. to pay for the health coverage. Uh, for the people who apply and also small businesses. We, well, so we that's had, an important part that we need to make sure that people know about. We had heard and we continue to hear that some businesses are saying, you know what, it's just not worth my while. I may have to lay off people instead of do this. I'll take the penalty that will go with this. Uh, they could pay a penalty sure. instead of insuring. How, is, that, is that problem a persistent problem? Is that problem a problem that, that you think you can deal with or make go away for that sure. matter? Two things. So the majority of small businesses in the United States are 50 employees or less, and they are not required to offer health coverage. And the majority of those with 50 and over already offer health coverage. So number one. Number two, that was the same story when we heard in Massachusetts, that this will happen in Massachusetts. It never happened. So that, that's a great litmus test to see what would happen nationally. So we are continuing to offer assistance background information to make sure that no business will drop employees. It, it's not good business either. How many people are eligible in this state? N over, a little bit over 900,000 people who are uninsured are eligible to get insurance October 1st, and over 700,000 of them will be able to get either Medicaid or tax credits to pay for that. Do you have any sort of internal guesstimations as to what percentage is likely to take advantage of these opportunities? We don't know yet, but our goal, my goal, the goal of our department is to get 100% of those 900,000. We're going to be working day in and day out until October 31st. One quick question. If 100% show up and say we want it, is the system big enough, strong enough, and capable enough to handle them all? We are open. We'll be open October 1st. And again, we're gonna, they're going to bring you some bugs. We know that. But remember, this is going to last until March 31st. We have a lot of time to get to all to those New Jerseyans who are been waiting for this moment. Dr. Torres, always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you for so coming much. in, sir. Thank you. Finally tonight, a vanishing breed, the story of a man and a wheel, and a symbol of the Jersey Shore that could be slipping away, as told by Nair Abdu of the Star-Ledger. I got a winner right there, another winner, another winner. I got a winner. The boardwalk is full of wheelers and dealers, but not many like Dave Scott. He's a lifelong wheelman. 
He's been doing this in Seaside Heights longer than there have been casinos in Atlantic City. We're going to try for two in a row. You know what that's called? Miracle. <laughs> I'd all for a miracle right here. Two in he entered the booth as a 14-year-old kid with a bad stutter. But the wheel transformed him to a fast-talking showman with a loyal following. Oh, no! Oh, for some no, two decades, no. Dave worked a 50-foot spread at the Palace on Casino Pier. People said to me, I grew up on your counter. Everything in my house, everything in my house is your stuff. And today I call it yard sale merchandise, you know. But back in the day, it was desired. And, you know, and people came there and they would come to get their merchandise from me. At 67, Dave's still working the same wheel. It's the last general merchandise wheel on the Jersey Shore. The guy who made this wheel, this was his last wheel he made. Each one of these nails is one space. Each thing that's on the laydown is one space up here. Pop, his mom, his Joe, his too. Sis, his pop. You got honey? Oh, oh, oh. oh the pain I feel. The guy just missed it by one nail. Now, this is the trick. You make it sound like gambling. And when you call off what they're betting on, they think that their horse is in the lead. As your winner, got a shot. Star's on the left, you got a shot. His There's no wife. lead here. The, the arrow just keeps going around, all right? His mom, his Sue, his Val, is for any prize. And then the finish. As you can see, it's got a half to go. It's here, it's going to stop here. And you can see what's there, so you start calling for that. And here comes this, and here comes that. And, here comes that. and next thing, they're jumping up and they're yelling, all right? And you don't get that any place else. Dave is a wheelman through and through. And you'd know that if you've asked him when he plans to retire. My son asked me that. He asked me when I was going to retire. And I said, uh, and, and the day I die. That does it for us. I'm Mike Schneider. Thanks for watching. Have a great night. And we'll see you back here tomorrow. Next on NJTV, BBC World News. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Join me tonight as I go one-on-one -on -one with those directly affected by Hurricane Sandy. We're coming together at the Jersey Shore. Tonight on NJTV, at 8, join the discussion on Moyers & Company. Then at 9, an ex-Python visits Tibet's death zone. And at 10, meet the unique characters of the Garden State on Driving Jersey. Saturday nights, all right.